Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and this week we're going to talk all about VPNs because you are likely uh, being asked to use one by your employer. We're going to look at the different types of VPNs and whether or not they really make you more secure. So let's get to it. Now this week's topic was suggested to me by a friend of mine, Tony Land, who's also a frequent viewer. Uh, because he's been getting a lot of questions from his friends and family about VPNs. A lot of people are being introduced to them for the first time as they're working from home, uh, but you're also inundated with advertisements on YouTube in particular about all these different VPN platforms and how they can make your life super secure. But the reality is it really depends on how you use that VPN and who owns that VPN. And we're going to talk about that as we work our way through the video here. Now, the letters VPN are short for Virtual Private Network. And the best way to understand how a VPN works is to look at how your internet connection works currently without one. So typically, you take out your laptop and you connect up to an internet connection, whether it's Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or cellular. Uh, your traffic to the internet to and from is routed through an ISP who gets you out to all those websites and services that you're using. And in a VPN connection, it works a little bit differently because you're still connecting up through the ISP, but all of your traffic is getting routed someplace else. So basically you've got a single connection that you're making to the VPN service and that connection is encrypted. So the cable company who runs your internet service is not able to snoop on you, uh, nor anyone at the local coffee shop. Basically you've got a bunch of gibberish that's getting sent out to the VPN server which essentially acts as a virtual ISP for you and will route all of your internet traffic uh, to and from uh, your location over that encrypted connection. And this is a way, again, to uh, potentially make your connection more secure and private, provided you trust whoever is running the VPN side of your connection, because you can often get into a lot of issues there. And to look at some of the things that a VPN might protect you from, uh, one of the most important ones is Wi-Fi, especially when you're at a hotel or at uh, some coffee shop. Any time that you connect up to a, a wireless access point that doesn't have a password, uh, your data is basically being sent out in the clear. Now, things are not as bad as they used to be because most websites now uh, do require some type of encryption to use them, so it's hard to now spoof your active sessions like you could do a couple of years ago. I've got a video about doing that, which I'll put down below in the video description, because about seven or eight years ago, you could walk into a coffee shop and somebody could basically take over your Facebook or Amazon account without even knowing your password. They could just pull the cookies right out of the air because you're broadcasting freely, unencrypted to everyone. Uh, things are a little different now, but uh, unencrypted websites are still vulnerable to that kind of snooping. Uh, and of course, the uh, person spying on you in the coffee shop can see every website that you're going to encrypted or not. Uh, so a VPN can really help you there because you're basically creating that encrypted tunnel somewhere else and they can't see anything that you're doing other than the fact that you're transmitting encrypted data back and forth to that VPN. Now your ISP can also do some nefarious things and share your data with lawyers, marketers, system administrators within the company and the government. Uh, some of the things ISPs can collect are the websites that you visit. Uh, they often collect that data and log it for some length of time. So if the government ever comes asking for your browsing habits, they can usually pull those right out of the ISP. Uh, you may notice that Comcast doesn't change its residential IP addresses very often unless you maybe change your cable modem or something. So there's a lot of data that they can collect and store uh, based on a specific IP address and then match that up with you, the user. Uh, they can monitor your packets because remember, uh, in the United States now, it is legal to prioritize traffic based on your activity. And in order to prioritize traffic, you got to look inside the packets going back and forth uh, from the computers on your network. So for example, if they see that you're doing BitTorrent, they might decide they don't like that, they're going to slow it down. Maybe they'll peek into there and see that you were transferring a music file to a friend of yours or something, and they may come after you for uh, music piracy or send your information to the record industry. There's a lot of stuff that they can do uh, because they have access to all of this raw data that's transiting your network. Uh, they can build marketing lists based on the data that they're collecting. They'll know what websites you visit. Even with an ad blocker installed and a cookie blocker and every kind of blocker you can think of, 
They're still seeing where you're going and how often and can build marketing profiles based on the fact that they sit kind of at the top of the stack for internet traffic and can really see exactly uh, where you're going. That's very, very valuable to marketers. And it's also valuable to the government who might want to uh, see what websites you're visiting or something along those lines. So there's a lot of things that the ISP uh, can get and store and communicate that might not sit well with people. And that's an area where a VPN, if properly implemented, can really help you because the ISP gets none of that. All they see is that you've been connected uh, to this VPN server and transferred a certain amount of data back and forth, but they can't see exactly what it is you're transiting or where that traffic eventually ends up. So let's take a look at the different types of VPNs you might encounter. We've got corporate VPNs, personal VPNs that you can host yourself, and then of course the VPN service providers that you see advertised to you constantly. Uh, let's start off briefly on the first two. Uh, corporate VPNs, of course, allow you to connect securely to your workplace. Uh, the best thing about a corporate VPN is that it allows network administrators to enforce the same rules on remote workers that they'll have if they were actually on campus. It's very secure. Everything is locked behind the firewall. You don't get in unless you go through, hopefully, some pretty rigorous uh, security and authentication protocols. Uh, but one of the things you have to be very careful about as an employee is to know that your activities, just like they are at work, are likely heavily surveyed uh, by your system administrators. So if you start doing something personal, even though you're at home, uh, if you're connected to that VPN connection, someone's gonna be able to monitor what you're doing while that connection is maintained. Even though that connection to the corporation is encrypted, what happens after you get there with your data is not. And there are many things that you can do inside of a corporate network to even uh, monitor what people are doing on secure websites, for example, too. So my advice here is only connect when absolutely necessary to get to your company resources because it's very uh, easy to make a mistake and inadvertently go to an inappropriate website or something uh, while you're connected to your VPN and don't realize it. Because a lot of times you don't even notice the difference in network speed. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your corporate stuff. And then we have the personal VPN. Uh, this is kind of similar to the corporate example, except the fact that the server is running inside your home. Uh, so for example, Jake who works for me here on the channel hasn't been able to come in due to the social distancing requirements that we're under right now. Uh, but he can connect to my VPN server and then get access to his computer on his desk over there. He can move files around the network. Uh, he can print stuff out if I need him to. Basically, he's got all the access that he has when he's sitting here, except he's not here. Uh, the only limitation is that my upstream bandwidth is only 12 megabits per second, so file transfers are very slow. They'll be a lot quicker uh, on the network here, of course, locally. But beyond that, he's able to get most of his work done uh, just by connecting to that VPN server. Now, in the past, we used to put our uh, computers basically on the internet. We would open a port on our router and you would connect to that port remotely with no authentication initially, and then you would log into the computer that way. Uh, but those things are easily sniffed and people can try to poke around and find vulnerabilities. The nice thing with a VPN is that they're a lot harder to hack, not impossible, uh, and are often much more secure. And again, that single connection gets you into everything and it's a secure connection right to my home. Now, if I were to browse the internet, I would be appearing as though I was coming out of my cable modem in the closet over there. Uh, so I could be in China browsing a website. That website would see me popping out here in Connecticut. And there's some benefits and perhaps some pitfalls with that, especially given that your upstream bandwidth will limit the amount of speed you'll get out of that internet connection while connected. So that's one thing to just keep in mind. One cool thing is that many routers now have VPN servers built into them. So I have a Unify router I'm using now. I've seen routers from Netgear and Asus and uh, Synology, which I was using before. All of those have really decent uh, VPN servers built right into the router, which can be really helpful. And if your router doesn't have that, uh, you can set one up on a Raspberry Pi for like 35 bucks. And we did a video about that when my hair was much shorter, when I could get it cut uh, last year or the year before, detailing how to use a Raspberry Pi as a secure VPN server. And that brings us to our last option, which is the VPN service provider. Now, the concept here is the same as our last two examples. You're remotely connecting to some other server to use its resources. However, you're not getting access to printers or a corporate network here. 
uh, you're strictly using the internet connection that that remote VPN server has and you're doing that to presumably get a more secure or more private connection and again we're going to have some caveats to that uh, use case in a minute uh, but typically these connections as we mentioned are shielded from ISP snooping because the ISP just sees that you're connected to the VPN service provider and nothing else it will do a great job of securing that insecure Wi-Fi at the coffee shop it's going to get around port restrictions and service throttling provided the ISP is not throttling the VPN port itself and it allows you to pop out in different parts of the world. What do I mean by that? Well, this is very similar to what I was talking about with my home connection in that I can choose what country on many of these VPN services uh, I want to appear I'm coming from. So for example, the other day, uh, I was browsing Netflix on my home internet connection here, and if I type in Star Trek Discovery, I don't have access to that show on Netflix here in the United States because uh, that show is only on CBS All Access in the U.S., but in the United Kingdom, if I'm on Netflix, I can watch Star Trek Discovery there. So check this out. If I go and connect to uh, the United Kingdom through my VPN service and hit refresh on the browser, uh, you can see with that very same search, I now have access to the show that I couldn't access uh, when I was not connected through my VPN service. Now, this is likely a violation of Netflix terms of service, so you have to be very careful about how you do this sort of stuff. Uh, Netflix and these other services have been getting a lot smarter about detecting VPN connections. Uh, this has largely been a game of cat and mouse, uh, but there could be some uses where it might be helpful to be popping out uh, in the UK or in some other country uh, that's different than the one that you're currently sitting in. And that's one of the things that some of the better VPN services can do for you with servers located all over the world. So that's one use that a lot of people like to use with them. And remember, we're bypassing the local ISP's ability to spy on our activities, uh, which of course include all the things we mentioned before. But you're basically swapping one for the other because the VPN is also able to do these things. And it's very important to understand this, that just because you're using a VPN doesn't mean you're more secure. It just means that you're moving your data to somebody else. And you have to really do your homework to make sure who owns this VPN because they could be owned by a government. Uh, there were some stories recently about how a number of these free mobile VPNs were actually based in China or had Chinese ownership. And in that circumstance, you could have government agencies spying on you, hoping to maybe find some person doing something that might be of value to their intelligence agencies, for example. Uh, all the protections you have legally as a citizen of your home country will mean nothing if the VPN uh, is operating in a different country where you don't have those rights. And this article in Computer Weekly says that about a third of the top VPN providers that you're likely going to be paying for might also have some degree of Chinese ownership. So do your due diligence. Uh, you might think you're more secure, but you may end up being less secure based on where these VPN services are located and what rights you're giving up if you're using a service that's not housed in your home country where your rights might be better protected. Also, Facebook and Google can still see you. So if you are logged into Facebook and then you pop onto your VPN, they can still track you with all the cookies that they've got installed everywhere. So it's not going to provide any protection there if you're using Facebook or Google. The VPN doesn't just clean off all the cookies and everything else like that. You need to do that yourself. So it's very possible and uh, certainly very plausible that uh, all of the stuff that you're giving up to Facebook and Google through your ISP will continue to get to those companies even through your secure VPN, no matter what country you pop out of when you log into that service. So what are some of the things you should be looking for in a VPN? Well, I would say uh, the first thing and most important thing is whether or not the VPN went through a third-party security audit. Uh, that's really important because that will be a set of professional eyes that are outside the company telling you whether or not uh, that company is a secure provider. If they're not showing you that data, if the audit provider they're using is not reputable, then I would look somewhere else. That's a really critical component here. Look at who owns the VPN. Are they a subset of some other service? Are they going to be owned by the Chinese government, for example? So be on the lookout for that. What's their logging policy? Are they keeping logs of your activities? If they are, uh, that will be in reach of whatever local governments have jurisdiction 
over them based on where their servers are located. And also look around and see what kind of past breaches there are. Have they had issues in the past with their security that might give cause for concern about how well they uh, are keeping their own infrastructure secure? Because if they get breached, your privacy is breached along with it, and that's something to be really concerned about. So these are the things that you should really look for in researching VPN services. And I would love to hear from you all on what you think the best VPN services are. Uh, as I mentioned, I use Viper VPN just because it's attached to something else that I'm using. Uh, I don't know if it's the best or not. It's certainly not the worst, uh, but I would love to hear some of the recommendations you all have and what you're using and what your experiences are down in the comments below. Now, the last option that's probably going to be something we'll discuss in more detail later is Tor or the Onion Router. Uh, this is something that can be very private and very secure if used properly. In fact, this is where the dark web operates because it can be very anonymous, again, if used properly and you protect yourself appropriately. Uh, we're going to pull back up this chart from the EFF, which shows you how a Tor network can protect you. So here we've got our hacker who's at your coffee shop. We've got the ISP spying on you. We've got the website you're connecting to, also keeping an eye on where you're coming from. But if you turn on the Onion Router, uh, things change significantly because yes, you still are going through your local Wi-Fi, but like the VPN we were doing earlier, it does mask some things that the hacker can't see because you're encrypting your connection to the Tor network. And what happens is, is your traffic is tossed through a number of Tor relays, and then it pops out at a random Tor endpoint, and that endpoint can change quite frequently. So right now I've got a Tor browser uh, running on my phone here, and then I can go up here and just uh, create a new identity for myself. And what'll happen here after a second or two, and it creates a new relay path, and if I do a refresh, uh, you can see now I'm popping out somewhere else in the European Union. So it's very anonymous. Uh, but again, the same issues that you're going to find with a VPN also apply here because if I'm logged into Facebook or I'm logged into Google, uh, the cookie is still following me around and that's something law enforcement can use to track you better. So Tor can be a tool that is a lot less expensive because it is free. Uh, it can be more secure and more anonymous, but you do have to take steps to protect yourself and your identity to ensure that you stay that way. Now, one thing to keep in mind about Tor is that just like the VPNs we were talking about before, uh, you are gonna pop out somewhere if you are accessing the public internet. And at those endpoints on the Tor network, uh, is where that information will exit. And if you are a government agency or some other organization looking for some interesting stuff, you might be poking around at those endpoints and monitoring traffic that's flowing through them because they essentially have what an ISP would normally have. And the US government, of course, has made some very famous arrests by uh, keeping an eye on those endpoints and seeing what's flowing through them. Uh, they've been able to trick people into clicking on a website and allowing cookies to kind of track their uh, location through the Tor network as well. So it's not uh, foolproof by any means, but it is a good way if you're looking for privacy and security to maybe get a little bit better without having to subscribe to one of these VPN services. Uh, one thing about Tor though is that due to its architecture, it runs very slowly because your data is getting tossed all over the world and back again. And you'll see that accessing websites and other services will be very, very slow. Sometimes changing your identity might speed things up, but generally it's certainly no replacement for one of these VPN uh, services from a speed standpoint. It's certainly not going to rival any one of those, but can deliver similar levels of privacy and security. So uh, that's the overview of VPN services. There is a lot more to talk about, obviously, that we can't fit into this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below, but just remember this is not a push button solution for better privacy and security. It does provide those things, provided you understand how the network works. And I think in many cases, especially if you're often going to hotels and other places with uh, very low security Wi-Fi, I think you can really get some benefit from them, but don't think of them as a solution again to all of your security and privacy concerns. This week's wrap up, by the way, is being brought to you by all of you. I wanna thank some super chatters, including my friend Brian Parker, who made a gold level contribution during our live stream this week. Also wanna thank John Simon, Big Yams, and Slink1284. We also got a bunch of new supporters this week. 
Uh, Slinky1284 also became a supporter through the Google membership program or the YouTube membership program. Uh, we also picked up Scarpian, Scarpian on that, Albert Da Silva and Trixel Garithum uh, on the YouTube platform as well. On Patreon, Caitlin Bessler and John Gonzalez also joined the program there. And Peter Hughes signed up for supporting the channel through our donor box page. And if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash support to find that donor box page. We also support Patreon and, of course, the YouTube membership program. Now, this week on the channel, we had two live streams. Uh, one, we built my new vMix production PC, which is driving the wrap up right this minute. It's been working great so far. I barely even hear it. It's been wonderful. I'm going to do a video on this shortly, so stay tuned for that, maybe in the next week or two. Uh, the other thing we did is we tested out the new 8-bit Doe Turbo Graphics controllers. And in the course of doing that, we constructed my new Raspberry Pi 4 rig. I bought a little case heat sink and fan kit for about nine bucks. So we put that together. And then we ran a bunch of different scenarios with those new controllers. So you can check that out on the link you see on screen there or down below in the video description for the master playlist. On the Extras channel this morning, we unboxed the new Chromebook Duet from Lenovo. And then we had a bunch of unboxings that were part of my unboxing video from last week. We decided to put those up as separate videos for the heck of it. On the main channel, we reviewed the new Dell XPS 13, a really nice flagship laptop from Dell. Uh, we also did the full review of those 8-bit Doe controllers. So if a three-hour live stream is a little too much, 11 minutes and 11 seconds, we'll get it done for you there. Uh, we also reviewed some new Mocha 2.5 network extenders from Translite. Uh, these have two Ethernet jacks on the back versus one on the other ones we looked at a few weeks ago. I know a lot of you find that Mocha content interesting, so have at it. You've got all of that linked down below in the master playlist. Now, this week on the channel, we've got a couple of things planned. Uh, first, we're going to be reviewing the Lenovo Duet. I'm going to start working on that review video right after I have lunch today, so that's coming up hopefully tomorrow. And then later in the week, we're going to have the new TiVo that just came out. This is an Android TV box on a, on a dongle, I guess. Uh, it is about $50, and it doesn't require any service or anything. It's just an Android TV box, and they're going to hopefully get you into their Sling TV service, which I think is the uh, idea here. But we'll put it through its paces and see how it performs. It's nice to see a low-cost Android TV option, and I'm excited to try that out. We're also going to have a review of a couple of portable SSDs from Sabrent, one Thunderbolt and one USB-C. And I'll talk about the differences that uh, the more expensive Thunderbolt drive will bring you, if any. Uh, so stay tuned for that. It'll be coming up later this week as well. And again, if we have time, we'll also be taking a look at my new production machine that we built on the live stream the other day. And it might be time to do the Floby. I've got my hair shellac today to keep it under control, but it is way too long. A lot of you have been noticing that. Uh, the barber shops here in my state might be opening next week, provided everybody can behave themselves for another week and keep the infection rates down here. So if I, uh, if I really screw up, I might have a, an escape hatch here. And I was hoping to try to get somebody from the company to uh, be a part of my Floby live stream here as I cut my hair, but nobody got back to me. So I might just try to get my barber on maybe to guide me from causing, not causing too many problems for myself. Uh, if you like what I do and want to get notified when we do the Floby stream or anything else, you can click the bell and that'll get you a notification sent to you whenever we've got anything going on. We have other channels you can find me on on screen here. Uh, we also have some ways to engage with the channel, including my Facebook group, which has been uh, really a fun place. It's delivered a lot of great ideas for this show and some of the other things that I do. So definitely sign up there if you haven't already. And we also have the store where I sell previously used items at low prices because they are uh, the things that we reviewed here on the channel and I need to get rid of them. So you can often get a good deal, but there's only one of everything because it's just the item we reviewed. Uh, so sign up for the store alert and I will send you an email every time we add something to the store. We got that Samsung tablet we looked at a few weeks ago waiting in there for you right now. And that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Rick Vestudo, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month.
Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.